What's up, YouTube family? Welcome to the Linked Up Church online experience. We're so glad you've chosen to tune in. Before we jump into today's video, we want to remind you that this channel isn't just for adults. We have content for babies in the Little Linkland section, kids in the Linked Up Kids section, and relevant services for your teenagers from the plug. So grab the whole family because we're about to get started. Be sure to subscribe to this channel so you never miss a video from us. And don't forget to share this video with someone who needs to hear an encouraging message. Let's jump in. Today we're going to start a new series. It's titled Fueled and Aflame. And so when we think about fueled, by definition, it means combustible, combustible matter used to maintain fire as coal, wood, oil, or gas in order to create heat or power. It's something that, sustain, that sustains or encourages. It is a stimulant. And so probably in today's vernacular, it is your why behind why you do what you do. And how many of you know we all need a why, right? We all need fuel. And a flame is a fire or on fire, a blaze. It means eager and excited. So how many of you know we need fuel to keep us on fire? Right? We need fuel to keep us ablaze. And we need fuel to keep us eager and excited. And so this past year and a half has been tough on a lot of people. I want to show a video right now that I think perfectly sets up uh, the direction of where today's portion of the message will go. And it's just a video about when times get hard. Life can throw you some curves. And it's not just the things that you see coming, but sometimes it's the things that you didn't see coming that hit you out of nowhere, that set you back in such a way that it seems like you can't get over. And you've reached your limit and your bandwidth is full. You already said, I can't take another thing. And then out of nowhere, here comes something you didn't see coming and you're in it. And in your homes, somewhere in your heart, these words are echoing. Am I going to make it? When you get into a tight spot and everything goes against you until it seems that you cannot hold on for a minute longer, never give up then, for that is just the place and time that the tide will turn. There are times when your energy feels so depleted that you want to give up, that it looks just totally impossible. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, don't give up then. That's when you've got to fall forward, when life is kicking dirt in your face. Don't give up then. That's when most people turn back. As long as you're alive, there is hope. You're still alive. You're still here. It's never too late. That it's never too dark. And we can always turn things around there's going to be bad days there's going to be dark days but you got to embrace it because that pain is what makes you stronger pain is the high cost of growth if you want to grow up you want to be mature there is no way to do it without pain you can't grow up on easy street and the very thing that discourages you is the very thing that develops you no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to save you. The only person that's going to make a drastic change in your life, whether that's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, the only person that is going to dig you out of your hole is who? You. You have to do it for you. You've got to become courageous to stand up within yourself, to face it and step forward. We all get a taste of that victim mentality, the why me? You can become the victim of the situation or the victor of the situation. You need to be the master of your emotions, not let them affect you. You are the dictator. You are the captain of your boat, whether you let things affect you in a negative way or a positive way. I don't lose. I only win or learn. In life, there's only winning or learning. All your problems become gifts once you learn from them. And some of you have allowed adversity to make you stop. And I'm telling you right now, don't give up. I'm telling you right now, don't give in. Get through it. Execute, execute, execute. In the midst of adversity, execute. You're going to work through this. You're going to get up. You're going to get dressed. You're going to get out. And you're going to do what you've been called to do. You're going to be what you called me. And you're going to prove to everybody that tried to break you, everybody that tried to kill your dream, you're going to prove all of them wrong. 
And if you can work through your pain, I'm guaranteeing you, on the other side is a reward. Pain is not permanent. Pain is temporary. And so somebody say this out loud. If God brought me to it, he'll bring me through it. Come on, say it with your chest. Say, if God brought me to it, he'll bring me through it. Do you all believe that today? Well, why don't you go ahead and thank God for a moment right at the top of the message that he's already brought you through. One of the toughest seasons of our lives. You know, some seasons are more stressful than others, especially seasons of great change. I don't think any of us woke up last February thinking that we would spend the next uh, a year and a half of our lives locked up in a house with masks on our face, needing to stay six feet apart. I don't think any of us woke up believing that that was the direction we were going in. So change sometimes creates a great deal of stress. But it's not what happened to you, it's how you respond to what happened to you. So regardless of how much emotional and spiritual reserves you had before the pandemic, I mean, whatever you had before the pandemic is not good enough for you right now. A stressful period can deplete all of your emotional and spiritual vitality a little bit at a time. And folks, I believe that's what's happened to the body of Christ over the last year and a half. We've just been depleted and depleted and depleted and depleted. And I believe God sent me to tell you that it's time to get our fire back. It's time to get our energy back. Come on, somebody. It's time to get our zeal back. It's time to get our enthusiasm back. It's time to get our love back for the things of God. So how do you keep yourself fueled and emotionally healthy? How do you keep yourself fueled and physically healthy? How do you keep yourself fueled and spiritually healthy during stressful seasons? So over the next several weeks, we're only going to look at one today, but over the next several weeks, we're going to look at 10 ways to keep yourself fueled and aflame so that you don't experience burnout. Let's read our foundation text for the day. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to read 11 through 13 out of the Message Bible, which gives us some tremendous insight on how to keep ourselves fueled and aflamed. Message Bible reads verse 11 this way. It says, don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflamed, which is where the title comes from. Notice who's responsible for your fuel And who's responsible for your fire? You are. He said, keep yourself fueled and aflame. Says, be alert servants of the master. So now we can also see that serving the master will help keep you fueled and aflame. How many know when you stop serving God, you lose some of your fire for God? He goes on to say here, cheerfully expected. And there's something about when I know I'm taking care of God's business, I have an expectation that he's taking care of my business. Notice he says here, don't quit in hard times. Then he gives us some insight into why people quit during hard times. Says pray all the harder. See, when things get tougher, that's the time to pray more and pray harder. A lot of times when you find yourself quitting in tough times, it's not because the tough times broke you. It's because you stopped praying. Prayer is the fuel that will keep you strong and on fire for the things of God. Proverbs said, if you faint in the day of adversity, I believe it's Proverbs 10, 4. If you faint in the day of adversity, then your strength is small. Scripture tells us then where do we get our strength from? then the joy of the Lord is our strength. So, right, if I get strength from having joy, then I need to understand, then where does joy come from? The Bible tells us that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. 
then how do I get into the presence of the Lord? Anytime I'm in prayer, anytime I'm serving God, how many of you know I'm in the presence of God? And how many of you know when I'm in the presence of God, joy is automatically going to be my strength. It is going to compel me and it's going to propel me forward over everything that life would throw at me. It says, help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. How many know there's always someone who is going through something worse than you are? And the worst thing we can do is only think about ourselves in tough seasons. We need to think about those that are even having tougher times than we are and ask God to show us how we can help that person. Let's read these same verses from the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation says, be enthusiastic to serve the Lord. Keep your passion towards him boiling hot. Folks, when you come in this building, you should be on fire for God. Man, why? Because you came in the building. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I can tell you one thing. I'd rather be in the hospital or in the house of God than in the best hospital in the United States of America. It is a greater blessing to walk in here than it is to walk into a hospital. The fact that you walked in here means that God has been good to you. And when you come through those doors, you, you should need the praise team to stoke you up you shouldn't need the prayer person to stoke you up you should come in here on fire for God because God has been that good to you sometimes we have to be like cheerleaders and we shouldn't have to be that way you need to come in here and bring energy and enthusiasm and excitement because you know God has been good to you serving God is what helps keep your enthusiasm high he said, radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. See, sometimes we've lost our excitement because we stopped serving him. Now, I'm just glad when it got tough for him, he didn't quit on us. I need a little better amen in that. And a matter of fact, the tougher it got on him, the more he gave to us. All he's asking us to do is to follow him with the same passion and serve him with the same passion that he went to that cross for you with. It's amazing. We can find all kind of reasons in the world why not to serve God. But we should be looking for every reason to why we should not serve, every reason why we should serve God. Passion translation goes on, passion translation goes on to say, let this hurt hope bursts forth within you hope is an expectation of something good in the future somebody say something good, something good. is coming for me, coming as, me. I as I serve the Lord did you catch that yes. say it the other way say as I serve the Lord, I serve the Lord my, future my future is getting brighter, getting brighter. And, brighter. and brighter do you all believe that but, but notice, it's as you serve the Lord. See, a lot of us want a bright, bright future. We want God to do something for us. Let this hope burst forth within you, releasing a continual joy. Don't give up in the time of trouble, but commune with God at all times. The tougher it gets, the more I fellowship with God. The tighter it gets, the more I seek God. The, the more pressure comes on me, the more I pray to God. It says, take a constant, constant interest in the needs of God's beloved people and respond by helping them and eagerly welcome people as guests in your home. In other words, be hospitable. Something here that sticks out to me, it says... This was so interesting to me. Take a constant interest in the needs of God's beloved people. Now, I want to take a moment here to thank all of the first line responders because they are true heroes. Every nurse, come on somebody, every hospital worker, every person that was willing to risk their life to save somebody else's, deserves a bigger hand clap and standing ovation than that right there. I've read stories about how nurses left their home states 
to go right into the heat of the battle where the pandemic was at its highest to help other people, to send their kids to their grandparents, come on somebody, and, and, and sacrifice their families so that they could go help somebody else in another state that they don't know, they never met, but yet they had a calling and a passion to help people in a time of need. They were willing to risk their lives every single day. But guess what, folks? Dream team leaders are frontline soldiers. Connect group leaders are first line soldiers. Parking lot people are first line soldiers. Come on, nursery workers are first line soldiers. Children's church workers are first line soldiers. Ushers and hostesses are first line soldiers. Why? Because in a lot of cases, we are an individual's last opportunity between heaven and hell. And it's a shame on us if we'll let nursery work, uh, nurses and doctors have more courage than we do. Come on, I'm preaching better than anybody saying amen right now. Shame on us if we'll allow them to go in every single day in the heat of the battle and put their hands on and be close to something that they know is dangerous while the church stays at home. Shame on us. That doctor and that nurse is limited. They can save a life, but they can't save a soul. And you tell me which one is more important to God, saving a life or saving a soul? Where are you dream team members? Where are the connect group leaders? Where is the ministry of helps? Where are God's frontline warriors? Because he needs us in times like these. You can be seated. By faith, somebody say, I am God's frontline soldier. Then report for duty. Don't say it and don't live it. We're only going to get through one point today because we did a lot already in this service. But today we're going to talk about God's grace is more than enough. Amen. New King James Version says God's grace is sufficient. In James 4, 6, the Passion Translation reads this way. But he who continues to pour out more and more grace upon us, that's God, for it says God resists. That means to stand against or oppose. I mean, no, I don't ever want God standing against me or opposing me. But he does that when you are proud. What does proud mean? Appearing above others, haughty. I don't need God. I've got this. God said, I've got to oppose that attitude. I've got to oppose that posture and that position. I need to stand against that. But watch this. But he continually pours out grace to those that are humble. Humble is the direct opposite of being proud. Humble is saying that I need you, God. I can't do it without you, God. God, you are the most important thing in my life. God, if you said it, then I want to be it. Humility comes under God. Proud opposes itself and stands against God. James 4, 7, it's not in your notes, but if the media team can pop it up there, verse 7, I felt it was important to read that in the Passion Translation. It says, so then surrender to God. Now, we don't like this part. Stand up to the devil. Stand up to the devil. Stand up to the devil. And resist him. See, it's not just standing up to him. It's also resisting him. It's also saying you will not have mastery over my emotions. You will not have mastery over my mind. You will not have mastery over my body. Come on, somebody. At some point, we've got to stand up and resist anything in our life that did not come from God. And then notice what the devil's response is to the person that will stand 
up to him and resist him. He will turn and run away from you. Not because you're so great, but the God in you is that great. Come on, somebody. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Folks, I don't know if anybody's ever told you or not, but there's nothing that this world can throw at you that is greater than the power of Christ in you. I need somebody. I need a witness in this place today. Why are we scared? Why are we running? Why are we hiding when we've got so much power on the inside of us? You are greater than what you realize. Not in and of yourself, but who's on the inside of you. Hallelujah. You can overcome. You have overcome. You can win. You have won. Come on, somebody. You are greater than the challenge that you're facing right now. Come on, somebody. You really are. You just need to know it. You need to wake up to the reality of it. And you need to attack it like it's trying to attack you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let's look at a story that I believe best illustrates what we're describing right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul here is the writer of this. How many of you know Paul was the most influential person in the entire New Testament? Paul penned three-fourths of the New Testament, but Paul was not oblivious to trials. Sometimes the greater God uses you, the greater trials you experience in life. A lot of us want to be used greatly, but we don't want to go through a lot. But the reality is, folks, the more you go through, the greater God is preparing you for. So if you're going through a lot right now, you're right where you need to be. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Come on, I said if you're going through a lot right now, you are right where you need to be. Because if you can see, if God can give you a glimpse of the reward that's on the other side of your obedience, if you'll just hang in there a little longer, pray a little harder, come on somebody, go at what's coming at you, the reward on the other side of that is going to blow your mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said here, I'm reading out of the Passion Translation, he said, the extraordinary level of the revelations I've received is no reason for anyone to exalt me. For this is why a thorn in my flesh was given to me. Now, of course, over the years, a lot of people said God gave him the thorn in the flesh to humbly. How I many know oh, God doesn't use sickness and disease to teach us anything? Nothing. Right? And the scripture, if people would just keep reading, the scripture tells you who sent, the, the, who sent the, the trouble. It says, the adversary who is Satan, messenger sent to harass me. So he told you who did it. Then think about it this way. Why would he seek God three times to deliver him from something that he believed God gave him? Doesn't make sense, does it? It's amazing to me how that doctrine got out there that God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. No, he didn't. You all want to know the truth? I don't even want to serve a God that treats me like that. I really don't. I'm just being honest with you. And I don't know why Paul would seek him to be delivered from it if, if, if God gave it to him. Let's keep reading. Just a little nugget for somebody out there. How many of y'all ever heard that teaching growing up in church, right? Let's keep going. Said, the adversary's messenger sent to harass me, keeping me from becoming arrogant. Now, what we can learn from this is when you get proud, circumstances will bring you low. See, arrogance means look what I did. I got me here. Look how smart I am. Look what I built. Aren't I awesome? Now, now, how many of y'all know? Circumstances will come. Life has a way of showing you who you really are. Come on, anybody ever been there before? See, see the moment we start smelling ourselves, Life can make sure you realize you are not everything you thought you were. Come on, am I the only one that's been humble? Come on, am I the only one that's been, when I, I thought, look at, look at me, <laughs> look, look, look at me. 
And God said, yeah, look at you. Come, come on, am I the only one? <laughs> Verse 8, he said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to relieve me of this, but he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you, and my power finds its full expression through your weakness. Paul got it then. He said, so I will celebrate my weaknesses. For when I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. Now, we're talking about God's grace is more than enough today. It's God's grace is sufficient for whatever you're going through right now. Grace, by definition, is his graciousness, his gratitude, his benefit, his favor, his joy. How I many you know God is a liberal God, his liberality? He'll always give you more than what you deserve when you stay humble. Sufficient just simply means enough or more than enough. Perfect means to finish, fill, fulfill, or complete. Folks, I submit to you today that the good work that God has begun in you, he will perform it all the way to the end. Weakness means feebleness of body or mind, frailty, sickness, disease, infirmity. So if you have any of that going on right now, I want you to know that God is at his best when you are at your worst. Now, I need to say that the right way. Only when you're at your worst and you realize you need him. You don't want to be at your worst and blaming him for the situation you're in. God, why did you allow? I mean, you know, sometimes kids can be like that. They blame you for the choices they make. Anybody ever raised teenagers before? Right? Anybody, any parents know what I'm talking about? Think about your response when you know that you wiped the kid's butt when they couldn't wipe their own butt. Come on, somebody. Come on, you fed the child when the child couldn't even feed themselves. I need a little bit, of, a little more help in this room. Come on, when, when the child couldn't put on their own clothes, you put the clothes on for them. Come on, somebody, you sacrificed and you drove less and you wore less. Come on, somebody, so that they could have better. And now we get here? Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? What is that parent's response? I dare us ever question God about where we are in life. Because wherever you are, you need to thank God for it. Come on, somebody ought to right there just lift up their hands. Come on, online. So, thank God right now. I, I, if he didn't do anything else for me, I'm thankful for where I'm at. Gratitude is the proper attitude. A lot of times kids wouldn't understand it. If all they ever said, if they just said, I thank you for everything that you've done for me. How I many you know parents getting ready to help do more? That's all we want to see. I could have handled that differently. I could have. Just, just own what you did. Be responsible for what you did. Then you get all the help of the parents. But try all of that. I wouldn't be like this if it wasn't for you. I'm just showing you, sometimes we can be our own children towards God. You all want a little bit more of this today? How many of y'all, see, I can see your faces today. Now I can see you're not smiling at me right now. Come on, I want to see all teeth right now. I want to see your teeth. All right, let's keep going. Now think about this. I want you to really understand what God is saying here. Why does God say my grace is more than enough for you? I want you to really think about that. Why did he say my grace is sufficient for you? Paul asked him to remove the thorn in his flesh. And God said, no. No, my grace is sufficient. What does it mean when God says, my power, which is dunamis, miraculous ability, is made perfect in your weakness? Right? Something about that just doesn't sound right. What does my grace is sufficient literally mean? I want to give you the answer to that. It means that God chooses to display his power in us 
by sustaining us in our weaknesses. He chooses to. And I pray that you catch this. He literally chooses to demonstrate his power in us by sustaining us in our weaknesses. See, here's the reality, folks. Uh, let me keep reading. So all of this makes God's preferred method of showing off his power different than anything we've ever experienced before. See, a lot of times we've got to get to the end of ourselves before he can show up. So God's grace is sufficient and his power is only made perfect in our weaknesses in this context in our brokenness in our weariness see here's the reality folks every day I feel insufficient to pastor this church every day I wake up I feel insufficient in and of myself I can't do this Here's the reality, folks. In and of myself, I feel insufficient and weak as a husband. That's the reality of it. I just can't ever be everything that she deserves. Here's the reality of it. I feel weak and inefficient as a parent. There's nothing in life that shows me that I am nothing and I am not who I thought I was than parenting. Because we set out a road map, we we paved a way, and sometimes it doesn't go the way that you set it up to go. And nothing shows me more that I am not who I thought I was. Then my failures, my weaknesses, my inability. Come on, somebody. And I need God. The reality is I'm weak, I'm broke, and I'm tired. And if God doesn't help me, I don't have help. So when Paul begged God to take away his thorn in the flesh, God said this to him. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, for my power is complete and is full when you are at your weakest. Why does God use our weaknesses? God could have delivered Paul and said to him, My power is made perfect in my deliverance, but he didn't. He could have said to him, my mighty deliverance is sufficient for you, but he didn't. Instead, he left Paul in a crippled state and he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. It's more than enough for you and my power will be made perfect and complete and full when you realize all you need is me. Somebody say, God's power is greatest when I'm at my weakest. See, sometimes when we stop doing for God, we're doing for ourselves. Just want to help people. See, when I'm so busy chasing my dreams... I'm relying on me. I don't have really time for God and the things that are important to God because I'm doing me right now. And at some point, we got to think about how well am I doing doing me? So what we need most in our weakness is God's sufficient grace. 
Not more strength. Come on, not a dramatic deliverance. God didn't deliver him. God didn't give him more strength. God gave him grace. In other words, what we need most is not our not better circumstances. See, we say, we pray, God, if you put me in a different situation, but what God is saying, no, I want you to stay in the situation so you can see how great I am in it. Come on, I need a little better amen. God, if you can just re remove this pain, if you can just remove this, if you can just change him, if you can just change, no, God is saying, no, stay in it so I can show you that my grace is sufficient. Why? Because God will get a greater glory delivering you out of what you wanted to get yourself out of. Come on, somebody. Then you getting yourself out of it only to find yourself in the same situation again because you didn't depend on him. So why is God so insistent on using our weaknesses to show off his strength. Why does God repeatedly say to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Let's look at a couple of ways. I'm sure I won't get through all of them, but I'll get where I need to get for today. Number one, my grace is more than enough for you simply means God gets all the glory. See, there's something about when you do something and you win, you give yourself the glory. But it's something else about when you realize you can't do anything and then God does it for you, come on somebody, that God gets all the glory. People ask me all the time, how'd you all do it? I don't know, I'm not, I don't know. All I know is I was a broken man. All I know is I was down in the dumps. Come on, somebody. All I know is all I can muster up in prayer was, God, if you don't do it, then it won't get done. See, if I can sustain myself through trials by my own grit, my own moxie, my own education, come on, somebody, then I would take some of that glory from God. If I made it on my own, right, I'm locked, I'm loaded, come on, I'm buckled down, come on, I, 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 I did everything, I did what I needed to do, I hacked my way all the way to the finish line, right? That's my, the language of my victory, then I'm giving myself all the glory. But in reality, folks, when you get to heaven, none of us will be boasting about anything that we've done. When you get to heaven, you're going to realize that there was an angel that was assigned to you that helped you get through that situation. Come on, when you get to heaven, the only boasting that you're going to do is that, God, you built linked up church. God, you sustained it. God, you blessed it. God, you blessed my marriage. God, you saved my children when I didn't have what it took to get them where they needed to be. Come on, somebody. The only boasting that we will do when we get to heaven is that, God, God, you are good, and the only reason I'm here is because of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And anything that I accomplished while I was on that earth, it was because you did it for me. Come on, somebody, and give God the glory and boast on God. That's the reality, folks. I am nothing without God. And anything that I have and anything that I've done, it's only because of God's grace and his mercy. Because I promise you, Joel Gregory doesn't deserve it. It's not because Joel Gregory is good. It's because God is good. And somebody ought to give God, a good God a great praise in this place right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Number two reason, when God says his grace is more than enough, it shines a spotlight on his power, not our power. 
One of the great lies that I'm, I'm speaking about myself that I'm always tempted to believe is that I'm sufficient. And I'm just telling you as a man, I can be a prideful fool. And I'm telling you that God's honest truth. Because I always can get to a place where I say I'm good. I don't need you. And that's a, I want to say it another way, that's a poor attitude. Because the reality is I need everybody that's in my life. And the only reason I'm here is because other people helped me get here. But sometimes my little poor, prideful mentality I'm good. No, I'm not good. I'm hurting right now, man. Men are real good at masking that stuff. I'm straight. I'm good. I'm fine. Are you really? I don't need anybody. You want to go? Go. We know we don't mean that. I make the horrible mistake too often of thinking I'm sufficient. As if I'm the reason I got here. I need somebody to recognize that. You better start looking at the people that helped you get there a little differently. Get a little humility about you. I make the horrible mistake of thinking for everything in my life, Joe Gregory, you are sufficient. And that's fool's gold. Joe Gregory, you are sufficient for life. Joel Gregory, you are sufficient for your marriage. Joel Gregory, you are sufficient for parenting. All of these situations I just described, that's why I wrote them down about myself, have shown me that I am nothing without God. God's grace is enough. It shines the spotlight on his power, his ability, and not mine. Number three, why is God's grace more than enough? It highlights the glory of his deliverance. Folks, God loves to deliver his people when the stakes are at their highest. When the odds are stacked up against you, God loves to deliver you. Why? Because he gets all the glory in those situations out of delivering you. If you study your Bible, God loves Hail Marys. God loves the do or die moment. Come on, somebody. God loves a buzzer beater. Think about Gideon, folks. God told him 30,000 is too many. Then he told him 3,000 is too many, Gideon. I want to send you with 300 into a battle against thousands. So Gideon, you can learn that if I don't fight this battle for you, you don't have a chance at winning. Come on, I need a little better amen than that. Come on, David and Goliath. That giant came out for 40 days, defying the armies of Israel. Every day, taunting them and talking about the power of his God. And one day, David's father told him, take some lunch down to your brothers who were at the war. David heard the same words that everybody else heard, but David didn't hear them the way that everybody else heard them. David said, wait a minute, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is coming against the armies of the Lord? Come on, somebody. He said, I'll go to battle with him. And he went to Saul and he said, Saul, let me fight him. 
Saul said, here, well, take my armor. Well, why don't you use your own armor to go out there and fight? Saul said, no, take my armor. David tried it all, but David said, no, I have not proven these. But what I have proven are these slingshots. Come on, it's a slingshot and, and stones. So David grabbed five smooth stones and put them in his slingshot. Come on, somebody. Goliath was huge and David was small, but that's when God is at his best. And when that giant began to run at David, come on, David began to run at that giant. And I believe with all of my heart that David reached in his hand. And when he began to swing that thing, an angel jumped behind that stone and smacked it with supernatural power. And it knocked Goliath in the head and it knocked him out. Because God wanted to show Israel that you cannot be your giants without me. Come on, somebody. Stop trying to fight your giants without God. And if you are in a position right now where it looks like all odds are stacked against you, you are in the right place at the right time for God to show up and do something miraculous in your life. And I'll close right here. I'm just going to stop right here for the day. Number four, I actually had six of these. Can I tell you one more? Moses delivers the Egyptians or, or the, the children of Israel from the Egyptians through a great deliverance. And I'm going to teach you something about people here real quick. But just like anything else, God is going to put you in a position where you've got to trust him all the way through. You cannot live off of yesterday's victories. Come on, somebody. You got to seek God all the way through. And you're going to be put in a position in life where you're going to have an army behind you and a river and the Red Sea out in front of you. And come on, somebody. They're all right there. And, 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 and now Pharaoh has 600,000 of his chosen men and chariots. How I many of the children of Israel can hear those chariots and those horses' hooves coming at them? 600,000 of them. And they get in fear. Now, they've watched Moses deliver them. They've watched the, everything that Moses did to get them out of Egypt. But then they turned on Moses. And they said, Moses, there were graves in Egypt that we could have been buried in. But you brought us all the way out here into this wilderness. And, folks, sometimes being a leader is a lonely place. Because sometimes the very people that you help, But that will never change what God called you to do. I'm going to teach you something here. So, so now you've got 600,000 choice men, chariots, and horses, and a sea in front of them. And Moses cries out to God. And I'm going to show you something. This is where men, I'm talking to men in particular right now. You, this is where you got to have something about you. And God said back to Moses, why are you crying to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Stretch out your rod and watch my mighty deliverance. And it's interesting that Moses, all he stood up and said was to the children of Israel. Now, I mean, you know, most of us would have turned around and said, all of y'all die right now. Come on, let's just be honest, right? Moses turns around and he says, stand still and see the salvation, not of Moses. Come on, somebody. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Linked up, church, God sent me here to tell you today, it's time for us to go forward. It's time for us to stand still and see a great deliverance by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's time for us to stop hiding, stop running. We are frontline soldiers, and we must be about our master's business. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's grace forces us to trust God. 
When you get in pride, you are going to be put in a place where the only person you're left to trust is God. This is why it's better to humble yourself. Because life will humble you. With your fine self. Your handsome self. Your educated self. Come on, somebody. Come on, your beautiful house living self. Come on, somebody. With your beautiful car driving self. Come on. With your educated self. Come on, somebody. Come on, I need a little better amen in here right now. Life has a way of showing you that none of that means nothing without God. It's already 10 o'clock. But I'm led to do something if you all will release me to do it. And, and if you need to leave right now, you, you're certainly released. But God sent somebody here today. When God says my grace is more than enough, all of us will be in a situation in life where you're going to learn that if God doesn't do it, it can't get done. I promise you, I got a situation in my life right now that if God doesn't do it, it can't get done. All I can do in this moment is give it to God and trust him. Second Corinthians chapter one. I'm going to stop here, but I want to get this verse out. Paul writing here in the first chapter of second Corinthians, verse eight and nine. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. Notice what Paul says here, who God used more than anybody else in the New Testament. He said, brothers and sisters, you know, you need to know about the severe trials we experienced while we were in Western Turkey. All of the hardships we passed through crushed us beyond our ability to endure. And we were so completely overwhelmed, watch this, that we were about to give up entirely. See, we didn't know Paul got to a place where he was ready to quit. Can I just be honest with you for a moment? If you only knew how many times I wake up wanting to quit. Quit this, quit pastor. I'm being, quit being a husband. Quit being a father. If you only knew how many days I wake up like that. And if I didn't get in prayer on that day, and if I didn't spend time in the word on that day, in any one of those three areas, I could have did something stupid. Sometimes life will put you in a pressure cooker. <sighs> Verse 9, Paul said, it felt like we had a death sentence written upon our hearts. See, the key there is felt like. Not actually one. But sometimes we get in our emotions and our feelings. And things feel differently than what they actually are. And our feelings and our emotions deceive us. 
because we don't submit them to the word of God. And we still feel it to this day. I'm talking to somebody in this room right now. It has taught us to lose all faith in ourselves. Notice what it's teaching them. Notice what it's teaching them. To lose all faith in themselves. See, your situation is teaching you to lose all faith in yourself. That's why you're in it. Hello? Your situation is teaching you how to lose all faith in yourself and to place all of your trust in God who raises the dead. Which tells you that anything that's dead in your life, God can raise it if you'll stop trusting yourself and start trusting God. Now, I know what God led me to do today. That's multiple people in here. The Spirit of God is speaking to you right now, and you know you are in a situation where you need to lose faith in yourself. Come down here to the front right now where all odds are stacked straight up against you. If you need to leave today, you're dismissed. But if you can stay, stay and pray for these people. And I hope pride doesn't keep you in your seat. If you're watching online, you can stand up right where you are. Just come on down here to the front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get as close as you're comfortable getting to other people. I'm actually not getting ready to lay hands on you because nobody laid hands on Paul. There was just a word that God spoke over him that I'm getting ready to speak over you all. Just get down here as close as you can. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands to the Father. Do you have anything that will fit right there for a moment just to prepare their hearts a little more? Just anything to... Shira, you are enough. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Shira, you are enough. And I will be Every circumstance, Chira, you are enough. Forever enough, always enough. You are more than enough. Forever enough, you're always enough. You're more than enough. Forever enough, always enough, you are more than enough, yes Lord, forever enough, always enough, you are more than enough, I call you Jaira, and you are enough. else that needs to get down here right now in particular men because we, 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 we sit in this I'm good I'm good I'm good 
Anybody else? It's really just between you and God right now. Not anybody else in this room. It's just between you and God. I know there are others right now. Thank you for your obedience up there. There's a blessing in that obedience. Thank you for your obedience, sir. There's a blessing in that obedience. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you for your obedience. Get down here and get as close as you possibly can. Holy Spirit is Forever doing something. Enough, holy is enough, Hallelujah. You are more than enough. Hallelujah. All right. Forever enough, always enough. Only you are more than enough. Thank you, Minister Bernard. Anyone else today? Thank you for your obedience, sir. Anyone else? See what God is doing right now. Is breaking your power over your life so that he can release his power in your life if you would allow him. You've got to cooperate with that. He's breaking your power over your life so that he can release his power in your life. Who else is that? Who else is that? Male or female, who else is that? Thank you for your obedience, sir. Thank you. It's a blessing in that. Thank you for your obedience. He's breaking your power over your life so that he can release his power in your life. Who else is that? Come on. He's getting you to the end of yourself. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you, sir. Bring your whole family. That's a leader. That's a real leader right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right, I want everyone that's down here right now to just lift your hands up towards heaven. All right? And I want to remind you, Paul asked God to remove it from him. But God didn't. God said, I'm going to deliver you in it. I'm not going to remove it from you. I'm going to deliver you in it. So don't expect something here. This is going to require work. This is going to require effort on your part to press in, spend time in prayer, get closer to God, spend more time in the Word, get back to serving, get back to your disciplines. Now, I want you to say this after me. Say, Father God, I believe in my circumstances, your grace is more than enough. When I'm weak, you are strong. When I'm at my worst, you are at your best. So, Father God, I receive a supernatural deliverance according to your grace in my situation now in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, go ahead and praise God and give God thanksgiving and glory. Come on, open up your mouth and give God glory for that right now. Okay? Now. Just because of our time, there's a lot we could do right here, a lot of songs we could sing, but I just want to be respectful of your time, but I want you to listen to me. There are people that are down front right now. You are not saved, and that's a primary issue. There are people that are down front right now. You got away from God. You know in your heart that you are, your relationship with God is not right right now, and you need to get that right. That's part of the problem. There are people down here right now, you've never been baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to receive that today. There are people down here right now, you're not committed anywhere. You're just attending churches. You're just showing up and leaving and not accountable to anyone or anything. And you already know where you're supposed to be. So if you're not saved, if you're out of fellowship and you wanna come back to God, if you've never been baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, Bible evidence of praying in other tongues or you want to join Linked Up Church, I want you to stay right down here. Everyone else can go back to their seats. If you're not saved, stay. If you're out of fellowship, stay. If you've never been baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, stay. If you don't have a church home and God has dealt with you that this is where he wants you planted, stay. Thank you for your obedience. Anyone else? Thank you for your obedience. Okay. Thank you.
you for your obedience today. Okay? Thank you all for your patience today and your supply of the Spirit, your prayers. Now let me formalize that for everyone watching online and anyone else in this building. In an atmosphere like this, God can do more in your life than you can do in 20 years. In an atmosphere like this, the Holy Spirit can do more in a moment than you can do in 20 years. So if you're in this building right now, respectfully, please everyone stand to your feet respectfully. We're respecting the presence of God. I'm certainly not asking you all to stand up for me. I promise you that. We're respecting the presence of God. So if you're here today and you're not saved, you didn't come down front, but you were up in that balcony down on this floor, you know in your heart you are not a born-again Christian. Secondarily, online, this applies to you as well. You did not come down front, but you know in your heart I am not right with God right now. I'm saved, but I know I'm not living in a way that is pleasing to God. He's still thinking about you. Thirdly, you didn't come down front, but you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need that gift. You need that power in your life. Finally, if you don't have a church home, online or in the room, God has confirmed that this is where he wants you planted. Right where you're standing right now, would you shoot your hand straight up in the air? Just lift it up. Keep it up as high as you can. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? God bless you in the balcony. Anyone else? All right, do me a favor. Online, just lift your hand right where you're at. God sees you. Even if we can't see you, God sees you. I want you to do me one more favor. Gather up all of your personal belongings. Come meet me right down here at the front. Linked up church, encourage them. Applaud for them as they come. Come on down now in Jesus' name. Come on, that's a long walk from that balcony. I want you all to cheer and clap for them and give God glory until they get all the way down here. God, thank you for your obedience. Praise God. If you all would, lift up one hand towards heaven because that's where your help comes from. Online, if you want to give your life to Christ, you want to come back to Christ, we've got a way for you to join Linked Up Church. I'll talk to you more about it uh, in a moment. Also be baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. Just put your hand over your heart right now. If you want to give your life to Christ or you want to rededicate, okay? Repeat this after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God I believe that he died rose from the grave and he is alive right now Lord Jesus come into my heart and save me now as a result what I've confessed with my mouth what I believe in my heart I am right now born again and in right standing with God and all my sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. Linked Up Church, give them another big round of applause. If you all would, look to your left, my right. See that young man with that Bible lifted up in the air? He's going to show you more specifically what you came down here for. If you all would, follow him right now. Linked Up Church, give them another big round of applause as they go. If you're watching online right now, you pray that prayer sincerely from your heart. I want you to take your next step. Help us help you by texting, get connected to the number that is on your screen. Help us help you. It would do God's heart so good if you would just take your next step by texting the number that you see on your screen, on the screen there. Just text, get connected to that number. We will follow up with you accordingly and make sure that whatever need you have, it is supernaturally met. Do that for God, do it for yourself. Take that next step. Thank you so much for watching our online service. We certainly don't take that for granted. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to get connected with us, we encourage you to become a part of our online community. That's right, and you can do that by subscribing to our YouTube channel, sharing this video with a friend, and following us on social media. Don't forget to meet us right here on this channel every Sunday for our services. 
If you desire to help us reach more people just like yourself and advance the kingdom of God, then click the Give button now. This will allow us to connect more people to God, their families, their purpose, and their communities. Thank you again for watching our service on today, and we'll, we'll see, see you next week. week.